Welcome to Oncology Data Advisor. I'm Kira Smith. Today I'm joined by Dr. Reed Merriman from Dana Farber Cancer Institute, who is a primary investigator of the EPCOR NHL1 trial that recently led to the approval of epcorvitamab for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Dr. Merriman, thank you so much for joining today. To start off, would you like to introduce yourself and share what your work focuses on? My name's Reed Merriman. I'm one of the uh, lymphoma doctors at Dana Farber. I'm a clinical investigator with an interest in immunotherapies for lymphoma patients. Great. Thank you so much for coming on today to talk about the approval with us. My um, pleasure. For some background, what makes DLBCL a challenging disease to treat? So diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the most common lymphoma subtype. It's diagnosed in about 25,000 patients in the U.S. each year. And we can cure most patients with initial therapy, probably about 65%. Uh, but if patients aren't cured, um, you know, treatment becomes more challenging. Fortunately, we now have CAR T-cell therapies, which are curative for a minority of patients. But for patients who um, either are not eligible for CAR T-cell therapy or who relapse after CAR T-cell therapy, and we have limited options. We have a few new treatments that were approved over the last three years, but they're palliative for the most part. Um, and, and often are not associated with long remission. So we really need new therapies, particularly for that multiply relapsed patient population. Um, it's an area of unmet need. Definitely. Um, since you were one of the investigators of the EPCOR NHL1 trial um, that led to the approval, what were some of the efficacy results um, and the kind of like the biggest highlights that led to the approval? Sure. So the... Um, the phase two trial that led to the approval of epcritimab enrolled about 150 patients with multiply relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, it was a heavily pretreated patient population. Patients received a median of three prior lines of therapy. About 60% um, of patients had primary refractory disease. About 40% of patients had received prior CAR T cell therapy. So a challenging patient population. Um, even so, um, responses were seen in many patients. The overall response rate was 63%. The complete response rate was 39%, both of which um, are very impressive numbers for, for this patient population. There's about a year of follow-up now, so we have some idea of what the durability of responses will be. And it looks like particularly complete responses are durable. So the median duration of complete response has not been met yet. So we need longer follow-up, but it, it may be possible that some patients will have really long-term remissions with this therapy. And you know, I think we're also seeing some encouraging numbers for patients with prior CAR T-cell therapy. These are particularly hard patients to treat. And while the response rates for the 40% of patients with prior CAR T-cell therapies were lower, um, the overall response rate was about 55%, and the CR rate was about 30%. Um, you know, those are still pretty good numbers for that challenging to treat population. And the duration of response looks similar for patients with prior CAR T-cell therapy. So I'm very excited to start using this drug uh, in clinic. Definitely. Those are very impressive results. Um, as far as safety, are there any toxicities uh, that clinicians should be particularly aware of to monitor for? So epcritimab um, has a similar safety profile to the other CD3, CD20 biospecific antibodies that are either approved or in development. Um, the most frequent uh, side effect that we, we think about is cytokine release syndrome. Um, in this trial that was seen in about 50% of patients, most cases of CRS are low grade, but a small number of patients did have grade three CRS. Um, so that's CRS that requires pressor support. That was 2.5% in this study. Fortunately, CRS with epcritimab seems to be uh, predictable in that it almost always occurs during the first two cycles. And most CRS occurs um, on cycle one, day 15, which is the first full dose of epcritimab. Um, so right now, patients uh, are hospitalized generally, or at least that's how they were managed on the initial clinical trials um, during that first full dose when we expect uh, to see the most cytokine release syndrome. Um, so that's a, a key um, toxicity that people should, should know about. And I think with time, we'll get better at predicting which patients to worry about CRS and which patients maybe we need to worry a little bit less, um, as we have done with patients treated with CAR T-cell therapy, where cytokine release syndrome is a common side effect. Unlike CAR T-cell therapy, we don't see a lot of neurotoxicity with um, bispecific antibodies, including epcritimab. 
Um, infections are another concern. Um, with any B cell depleting therapy, you worry about infections, you worry about uh, more severe viral infections like COVID infections. So that's another thing uh, to look out for if you're treating a patient with this drug. Absolutely, that's important to know. Um, so now that epcaritamab has received approval, how do you expect it to fit into the treatment landscape for DLDCL? So I think it's a moving question because there are a number of trials uh, that are testing epcaritamab in earlier lines of therapy. But right now, based on its current approval, I think this will be my go-to uh, medication for many patients who are ineligible for CAR T-cells or who relapse after CAR T-cell therapy. Um, so I suspect, you know, like I said at, at the beginning, that's an area of unmet need. Uh, we have many patients who, who are left without many good treatment options. So I think um, epcaritamab will be used in those populations. Definitely. Well, that's a very exciting approval for this disease. So thank you so much for coming on today to talk about it. Of course.